dear students, I welcome you all to today's lecture on gift or hiba under the Muslim law. The objectives of today's lecture are to understand the meaning of gift or hiba in the Muslim law. Number two, to understand the essentials of gift. Number three, Hanfi doctrine of Mushaha. Gift or hiba is the making of another person owner of the corpus of the property without taking its consideration from him. Thus, gift is the transfer of movable or immovable property with immediate effect and without consideration by one person called donor to another person called the donee and the acceptance of the same by one himself or by someone authorized in this behalf provided that the maker of the gift must totally renounce all his title and rights in the property gifted away of his independent free will. According to Amir Ali, I quote, a hiba is a voluntary gift without consideration of the property or the substance of a thing by one person to another so as to constitute the one, the proprietor of the subject matter of the gift. Muslim law allows a Muslim to give away his entire property by a gift in divorce, even with the specific object of disinheriting his heirs. The basis of the principle of gift is the Prophet, peace be upon him, saying, exchange gifts among yourself so that the love may increase. Narrated by Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, Allah's apostles used to accept gifts and used to give something in return. Every Muslim of sound mind can make a gift. There must be in every gift a bona fide intention on the part of the donor to transfer the property from the donor to the donee. Every Muslim male or female, married or unmarried, who has attained the age of majority and who is of sound mind has the mental capacity to make a gift. The rule of Muslim law of majority, that is the attainment of puberty, does not apply to gifts. A person of unsound mind can make a valid gift during lucid intervals. The Muslim lawgivers recognize the doctrine of ikrash or compulsion and a gift deed executed under compulsion is not valid. In such a case, the gift is voidable and it can be avoided by the donor whose consent was so obtained. Under the Muslim law, a gift may be made to any person without any distinction of age, sex or religion. Thus a gift may be made to a minor or an adult, to a man or to a woman, to a married person or an unmarried person, to a Muslim or to a non-Muslim. Under the Hanafi law, the doni must be legally in existence at the time of Hibba. This gift to an unborn person, one not in ease, either actually or presumably, is invalid. In Imam Sahib versus Amir Sahib, it was held that a gift to an unborn person is void. Under the Shia law, a gift to an unborn person can be validly made provided the gift commences with a person in existence. For instance, if a gift is made to a person for a life, then under the Hanafi law, A will take absolutely the condition being void. While under the Itna Asharia law, A will take a life estate, on, on the death of A, the estate will revert to the donor. Both among the Sunnis and the Shias, a gift to A and his children generally or to his descendants, line after line, would take effect as an absolute estate to A, the conditions limiting the estate being void. The contingent or conditional gifts are those which are made dependent for their operation upon the occurrence of a con contingency. A contingency is a possibility, a chance, an event which may or may not happen. In Muslim law, contingent or conditional gifts are void. In Muslim law, a gift is not rendered invalid by involving an invalid condition. Hanafi law clearly states down that in such a case, the gift is valid and the condition is valid. Under Shia law, if the conditions attached to a gift is subsidiary and then both the gift and the condition are valid. A gift as distinguished from a will may be made 
of the whole of the donor's property and it may be made even to an heir. Whether a document is a gift or a will can be gathered from the recitals in the document. Even the title to it is conclusive of its nature. Therefore, the terms, conditions and recitals alone determine the nature of the disposition. They are to be taken as a whole. When once it is clear from the recitals that the ownership has been transferred in presenti absolute, it is a gift and any condition imposed on the enjoyment of the property is invalid. The gift must be accepted and completed by such delivery of possession as the nature of the property admits. Now we shall discuss the essentials of a gift. It is essential to the validity of the gift that there should be number one, a declaration of gift by the donor, number two, an acceptance of the gift expressed or implied by or on behalf of the donor, and number three, delivery of the possession of the subject of the gift by the donor to the donor. Writing is not essential to the validity of a gift either of movable or of immovable property. In Kamaru Nisa Bibi versus Hussain Bibi, the Privy Council upheld a verbal gift. Section 122 to 129, Chapter 7 of the Transfer of Property Act 1882 deal with gifts. By Section 123 of the Act, it is provided that a gift of immovable property must be effected by a registered instrument signed by the donor and attested by at least two witnesses and that a gift of movable property may be effected by either by a register signed as aforesaid or by delivery. But the provisions of section 123 do not apply to gifts made under Muslim law, section 129 of the Act 1882. It has been held by the Patna High Court in Bibi Maniram versus Muhammad Isaq that the rules regarding Muslim gifts are based on reasonable classification and section 129 exempting Muslims from certain provisions of the Transfer of Property Act is not hit by Article 14 of the Constitution. The Transfer of Property Act does not apply to gifts made by Muslims. In their case, all that is necessary is declaration, acceptance and delivery of possession. The rule that Muslims can make an oral gift is a general rule applicable to property of any kind. It must therefore give way to any special rules relating to a gift of any particular kind of the property. The Supreme Court in Mahbub Sahab v. Sayyid Ismail has held that gift under Muslim law is not required to be in writing and consequently need not be registered under the Registration Act. For a gift to be complete, there should be declaration of the gift by the donor, acceptance of the gift expressed or implied by or on behalf of the donee and delivery of the possession of the property the subject matter of the gift by the donor to the donee. The donee should take delivery of the possession of the property either actually or constructively. In case of possession of immovable property, the donor should completely divest himself physically of the subject of the gift. The apex court in Hafiza Bibi was a Sheikh Farid held that merely because the gift is reduced to a writing by a Muslim instead of it having been made orally, such writing does not become a formal document or instrument of gift. When a gift could be made orally, its nature and character is not because of it having been made by a written document. What is important for a valid gift under Muslim law is the compliance of three essential requisite. The form is immaterial, although there is a tradition which indicates that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was against the revocation of gifts. It is well established rule of Muslim law that all voluntary transactions, including gifts, are revocable. Now we shall discuss revocation of gifts. Revocation of gifts before the delivery of possession. Under Muslim law, all gifts are revocable before the delivery of possession is given to the donee.
The fact of the matter is that under Muslim law, no gift is complete till the delivery of possession is made and therefore, in all those cases where possession has not been transferred, the gift is incomplete. The revocation of such a gift, therefore, merely means that the donor has changed his mind and does not want to complete it by the delivery of possession. Mere declaration of revocation by the donor or institution of a suit or any other action is not sufficient to revoke a gift. Until a decree of the court is passed revoking the gift, the donee is entitled to use the property in any manner he can also alienate it. The Gauhati High Court in Anwar Ali v. Muzibul Haq and the Patna High Court in Bibi, Riya Jan Khatun v. Sadrul Alam held that revocation of gift under Muslim law is possible only as long as donor has not relinquished his control and dominion over the property. But once the donor relinquished his control and the dominion over the property gifted, the donor retains no power to revoke the gift. Irrevocable gifts are those gifts which after the delivery of possession cannot be revoked even by the courts. In the following cases, the gifts are irrevocable. Number one, a gift by a husband to a wife or by a wife to the husband. That is where the donor and the donee are spouses. Under the Shia law, a gift by a husband to wife or vice versa is revocable even after the delivery of possession. Number two, where the donor and the donee are within prohibited relationship. Where the donor and the donee are so related to each other that their marriage is void on the ground of consanguinity, affinity or fosterage, they are within prohibited relationship. In such a case, gift by one to another is irrevocable. For example, gift by a brother in favor of a sister is irrevocable. Under the Shia law, if the donor and the donee are related through blood, though not within prohibited degrees of relationship, the gift is irrevocable. Number three, where the donor or the donee is dead. After the death of the donor or the donee, a gift becomes irrevocable. This is obvious because gifts begin with a declaration, that is offer and the acceptance, and the parties to the contract of gift are the donor and the donee. If after the completion of a gift, a court attempts to invalidate it, then decree would have to be passed against the heirs of the donee. This is not possible because heirs of the donee or donor were not party to the transaction of the gifts. Number four where the donee has transferred the property to another person. After the completion of the gift, the donee becomes an absolute owner of the gifted property. As such, the donee may transfer that property to another person. If a gift is revoked when the donee has already transferred the property to a third person, then interest of that third person would be affected and he would be put to a loss without fault of his. Number five, where the property is lost or has been destroyed. After the revocation of a gift, the property should revert back to the donor. But if it is lost or destroyed, there would remain nothing to be given back to the donor. Therefore, when the gifted property is lost or otherwise not available, the revocation would be meaningless. Number six, where the value of the property increases subsequently. The value of a property may increase by accretions or by accidental discovery of gold or coal mine or due to some other reason. After completion of a gift, if the value of the property is increased, it is natural that the donor would be interested in the revocation of the gift. Muslim law negates the possibility of revocation of gift by the donor due to such temptation. Number seven, where the property given is changed beyond identification. Where the shape, size and identity of the property has been changed and it is not possible to recognize that it is the same property which was the subject matter of the gift, the gift becomes irrevocable. 
For example, if a piece of gold or a bag of wheat is given in a gift and the donee has converted it into ornaments and flour respectively, the original subject matter cannot be identified. In such a circumstance, the gift is irrevocable because after the cancellation of the gift, the same property cannot be given back to the donor. Number eight, where the gift has been made to secure religious or spiritual benefits. Where a gift is made not out of natural love and affection, but with religious motives, its revocation may amount to a breach of a religious promise, which is not permissible. A gift for religious or spiritual purposes is called sadaka, which is irrevocable. Number nine, when a gift is in the form of hiba bil evas, that is to say, where the donor has accepted something as consideration of the gift, the transfer becomes irrevocable. As discussed in the following lines, Hiba Bil Avas is not a gift at all. It is treated either as a sale or as an exchange. Therefore, it is irrevocable. Gifts, that is Hiba in Muslim law, are of the following kinds. Number one, Sadaka. Number two, Hiba Bil Avas. Number three, Hiba Bil Sharatul Ivas. Now we shall discuss Sadaka. Where the object of the donor is to acquire merit in the eyes of the Lord and the recompense in the next world, the gift is called Sadaka. It is a gift with a religious motive. Like Hiba, it is not valid unless accompanied by delivery of possession. Unlike Hiba, it cannot be revoked, the reason being that the object of such a gift is acquisition of religious merit and has already been acquired. Sadaka is a transfer of property or rights in all respects, like a Hiba, except that in the case of Hiba, the object is to manifest affection towards the donee or win his regard or esteem. In the case of Sadaka, the object is to acquire merit in the sight of the Lord and recompense in the next world. Number two, unlike Hibba, a sadaka once completed by delivery of possession cannot be revoked whether made to a rich or to a poor man. Number three, unlike Hibba, sadaka need not be expressly accepted. Number four, like Hibba, sadaka is not valid unless accompanied by delivery of possession, nor is it valid if it consists of an undivided share that mushaha in the property capable of division. It is not invalid if made to two or more persons, all of whom are poor. Now we shall discuss Hibba bil Ivas. Hibba bil Ivas is a gift for a consideration. It resembles a sale in that a. Transfer of title is complete without delivery of possession and b. All the incidents of sale attached to it, including number 1. The liability of being preempted where the law of preemption is in force and number 2. The right to return a thing for a defect. To constitute a valid Hibba Bill Evers, the following two conditions must be present. Number 1. Actual and bona fide payment of consideration, that is, evas, on the part of the donee. And number two, a bona fide intention on the part of the donor to divest himself in presenty of the property and to confer it upon the donee. A hiba bil evas literally means a gift for an exchange. It is of two kinds, namely, number one, the hiba bil evas followed in India, and number two, the true Hibba Bil Ivas, which consisted of two independent acts, namely Hibba or gift, and number two, Ivas or return gift, not stipulated at the time of the gift. Thus, if A, without having stipulated for a return, makes a gift of his book to B, and B, in consideration of the book, without having promised it subsequently, makes a gift of a rupee to A, saying that it is Avas or return for the gift of the book, and delivers the rupee to A, the transaction is a true Hibba Bil Avas, and neither A nor B can revoke it. But in the Hibba Bil Avas, as practiced in India, there is only one act, the Avas or the exchange being involved in the contract of gift as its direct consideration. Thus, in the illustration, if A says to B, 
I have given this book to you in consideration of your paying me a rupee. It is Hiba Bill Evers of India. Thus, it is in reality a sale, while the true Hiba Bill Evers is not a sale either in its inception or completion. In fact, the Calcutta and the Lahore High Courts have held that a transaction of this character is nothing but a sale and that where it affects immovable property of the value of 100 rupees and above, it must be effected by a registered instrument as required by Section 54 of the Transfer of Property Act. Now we shall discuss Hiba Ba Sharatul Evas, where a gift is made with a stipulation that is Sharat for a return, it is called Hiba Ba Sharatul Evas. As in the case of Hiba, in the case of Hiba Ba Sharatul Evas also, delivery of possession is necessary and the gift is revocable until the Evas is paid. On the payment of Evas, consideration by the Doni, the gift becomes irrevocable. The transaction when completed by payment of Evas is, however, not very common in India. Now we come to the gift of Musha'a, that is the Hanfi doctrine of Musha'a. The word Musha'a has been derived from the Arabic word Shu Ya'a, which literally means confusion. Under Muslim law, Musha'a signifies an undivided share in a joint property. Musha'a is therefore a co-owned or joint property. If one of the several owners of this property makes a gift of his own share, there may be a confusion as to which portion or part of the property is to be given to the doni. In other words, there may be a practical difficulty in the delivery of possession if gift of a joint property is made by a donor without partition of the gifted share. To avoid any such confusion and difficulty at the stage of delivery of possession, the Hanafi jurists have evolved the principle of Musha'a. Where the subject matter of a gift is co-owned or joint property, the doctrine of Musha'a is applied for examining the validity of the gift. Under the Hanafi doctrine of Musha'a, gift of a share in the co-owned property is invalid, that is irregular, without partition, and actual delivery of that part of the property to the doni. However, if the co-owned property is not capable of partition or division, the doctrine of Musha'a is inapplicable. Hidayah lays down this doctrine in the following words, I quote, A gift of a part of a thing which is capable of division is not valid unless the said part be divided off and separated from the property of the donor, but a gift of a part of an indivisible thing is valid, unquote. A mushaw of undivided property may be of two kinds. Number one, mushaw indivisible, that is, a property in which the partition or division is not possible. And number two, mushaa divisible, that is, property which is capable of division. The law relating to both the kinds of mushaa properties are mushaa indivisible. Gift of mushaa indivisible is valid. There are certain properties which are by nature indivisible. The physical partition or division of such properties is not practical. Moreover, if against the nature of such properties, their partition or division is affected at all, their identity is lost, they do not remain the same properties which they were before the partition. For example, a bathing guard, a staircase or a cinema house etc. are indivisible. Mushaha properties. If on the banks of a river or a tank there is a bathing ghat which is in the co ownership of two or more persons, then each owner has a right to deal with his share as he likes, including the right to make a gift of his share. But if the sharer attempts to separate his share, the utility of the ghat would be finished. Where a staircase is owned by, say, two persons, then each being the owner of half of the staircase is entitled to make a hiba of his share. But if the staircase is divided into two parts, it would be either too narrow to be used by anyone or the upper half may come in the share of one and the remaining lower half in the other's share. In both the cases, the staircase would become useless for both of them and also for the doni. 
the doctrine of musha is not applicable where the subject matter of the gift is indivisible according to all the schools of muslim law a gift of musha indivisible is valid without any partition and actual delivery of possession thus if a gift of a share in the business of a turkish bath or a gift of an undivided share in the banks of a tank or river are valid gifts even if made without separating the specific shares now we shall discuss musha divisible under hanafi law gift of musha divisible property is irregular fasid if made without partition a co-owned piece of land house or garden is musha divisible the land may be divided and the specific share may be separated by a visible mark of identification similarly a partition wall may divide a co-owned house without changing its identity in other words a musha divisible may be divided easily without changing the nature and without affecting the utility of the property where the subject matter of hibba is musha divisible the hanafi doctrine of musha is applicable and the gift is not valid unless the specific share which has been gifted is separated by the donor and is actually given to the donee however under the hanafi doctrine of musha the gift without partition and actual delivery of possession is not void ab initio it is merely irregular that is fasid The result is that where such a gift has been made it may be regularized by a subsequent partition and by giving to the donee the actual possession of the specified share of the property it is evident therefore that the doctrine of musha is limited both in its application as well as in its effect The operation of the rule is subject to the following limitations. Number 1, the rule of musha is not applicable where the property is indivisible. Number 2, where the property is divisible, the doctrine is applicable but only under the Hanafi school. In other words, the doctrine of musha is applicable only where the donor is a Hanafi Sunni. Number 3, even under the hanafi school if a gift is made against the rule of musha the gift is not void it is merely irregular that is fasid number 4 hanafi law recognizes certain exceptions to this doctrine and in those exceptional situations the gift is valid though made in violation of this doctrine now we shall discuss the exceptions to the doctrine of musha The doctrine of musha is limited in its application and is subject to certain exceptions where the doctrine is not applicable. Exceptions to the doctrine of musha are number 1 gift of musha to the co-heir. The donor and the donee are co-heirs. If they are entitled to inherit simultaneously the properties of a person, gift of undivided property is valid. even if made without partition where a donor and the donee are co-heirs if a person dies leaving behind a son and a daughter and a mother then the son the daughter and the mother are all co-heirs as they are all entitled to inherit the properties of the deceased thus after the death of a muslim male his widow and his daughter are the co-heirs therefore the widow that is the mother of the daughter can make a lawful gift of her undivided share in the lands to her daughter without separating her share physically in muhammad baksh versus husaini bibi a hanafi woman died leaving behind her mother son and a daughter as her only legal heirs the mother of the deceased made a gift of her share to the son without separating her one sixth share in the properties of the deceased It was held by the Privy Council that the gift of the undivided one sixth share by the grandmother to her grandson or to her granddaughter or to both jointly was valid even without partition. Where the property is capable of division, a gift of an undivided share that is musha therein is irregular though not valid under Hanafi law. For example. A partner in a firm makes a gift of the partnership property to B. The gift is not valid unless the share is divided and handed over to B. 
This irregularity may be corrected and made valid by subsequent partition and delivery to the donee of the share given to him. Thus, the gift of musha is invalid and not void ab initio. Muslim law allows gifts to be made jointly to two or more persons, but where the gift of a property capable of division is made to two or more persons without specifying their shares or without dividing them, then the gift is invalid. However, such a gift will be valid if separate possession is taken by each one of the donee by mutual arrangement or in accordance with the deed. Shia law does not recognize the doctrine of musha. Under the Shia law, a gift of a share of divisible joint property is valid even if made without partition. Conclusion a gift is a transfer of certain existing movable or immovable property made voluntarily and without consideration by one person called the donor to another person called the donee and accepted by or on behalf of the donee. Such acceptance must be made during the lifetime of the donor and while he is still capable of giving. If the donee dies before the acceptance, the gift is void. The subject matter of the gift must be certain existing movable or immovable property. In order to constitute a valid gift, there must be an existing property. Under Muslim law, to be a valid gift, three essentials are required to exist. A. A declaration of gift by the donor. B. An acceptance of the gift, express or implied, by or on behalf of the donee. And C. Delivery of the possession of the subject of gift. Dear students, that was all about today's lecture on gifts, that is Hibba under Muslim law. We shall meet again with a new topic. Till then, take care of yourself. Goodbye and stay blessed.